So today is going to be the first one of, of our focus sessions. So uh, we had a number of events in the past uh, almost 24 months now. And um, we felt the need that, uh, of starting maybe going a bit deeper, deeper on some topics. Also, you know, the, the number of members has increased. So I think it feels right to start for some uh, focus groups. So today, this is the first one of these uh, sessions which are focused on a specific topic. Uh, before we get into that very briefly, Quantum London for the very few who are here for the first time, we are a community of people who are passionate about technology, specifically quantum computing. And um, I started uh, yeah, a couple of years ago now in a pub, uh, trying to understand what quantum computing is, more questions than answers. And over time, we realized that we need to, to bring in experts to try and unravel what uh, quantum is, and especially the impacts of quantum computing on our businesses. So we run e events uh, in the form of webinars. So bringing in these experts, explaining uh, what the technology is, when is the right time to engage with the senior people in our companies, and what the future looks like more in general. But we also have more informal conversations like the one we're having today, where we bring into community. So the people who gravitate around Quantum London together, even to a more of an informal set to have some conversations around uh, these topics. We also run a coding community uh, every other week or so, where people can get their hands dirty with the coding as well. So again, tonight is going to be focused on the security aspect. And um, uh, we know this is a, a very important topic. It might be the entry point in the sense of you know, getting the attention of the senior stakeholders because it's a pressing issue. So for tonight, we have, uh, we'll start with Anahita uh, doing a smart summary of a presentation she recently delivered at Lloyds of London, where she's touching on this point. And then we will open up for uh, you know, all the community members for uh, you know, some questions and polls. What we really want to do tonight is a kind of a kickoff. We also rely on your uh, input on how you think this should be shaped. So this is the community getting together and trying to help us shape what's coming next into this topic. So Anna, I think with me done, I will hand over to you. You're on mute. One dollar into the pot. Hi, everybody. Could you see my screen? Yeah, good. Fantastic. So thank you, Em. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Before we jump right into the discussion and get to hear your thoughts, I just wanted to give a very high level overview background to this for anybody that is new to the topic or for anybody who is new to the concept of quantum computing for that matter. So a good place to start off would be, what is quantum computing? So the image that you can see here on the right hand side is in fact a quantum computer, which probably looks completely different from any device that you're joining this Zoom call from. And that's because quantum computing is a fundamentally new type of computing technology. It's based on the laws of quantum mechanics, which are the laws of nature that govern really tiny objects and have all sorts of wacky and quirky um, properties. And quantum computers can be used to perform calculations that aren't accessible to our classical computers today. So um, really important to know is that quantum computers aren't just a more powerful version of our qu computers today, but they're an entirely new technology paradigm. So how is quantum computing different? In classical computing, information is represented by bits, which are well-defined and can take a value of one or zero. So all of the sort of emails and videos and everything that you um, watch and interact with on a computer is essentially a string of one or zeros. However, in quantum computing, the unit of information is a qubit. And a qubit can take a value of one and zero at the same time, or any of the infinite combinations in between. And this property, as well as the fact that qubits can interact with each other in quant uh, via quantum mechanics, um, means that quantum computers essentially perform calculations in an entirely different way. And sometimes that can lead them to have exponential speed ups over classical computers. So why don't we have quantum computers today? Um, the reason behind that is essentially there are some quite challenging hardware um, problems that we still face. For example, the qubits that we just mentioned, um, they 
it's very hard to keep them in a quantum mechanical state that they need to perform um, their calculations on a quantum computer. And also for some qubit technologies, we need to, for example, cool them down to temperatures below that of interstellar space. Despite this, there's been increasing investment in quantum computing globally, both from the public and the private sector. And we've reached some really exciting milestones in recent years. For example, in 2019, Google reached um, something called quantum supremacy, which essentially means for the first time, they were able to show that a quantum computer could perform a calculation um, faster than a classical computer could. Amongst the um, quantum computing hardware players are some of the major tech companies. There's also a host of software and service companies that have come up in this space, which is interesting since they're providing service for, hard, for hardware that doesn't exist yet, which just goes to show the confidence that exists that this technology is in fact coming. And there's a lot of people that are banking on that and putting a lot of money into it. So what can qu quantum computers actually do? Some of the really cool things, for example, include um, being able to simulate molecules and atoms and proteins. And this is something that we currently just can't do using the computers that we have because of the complexity behind it. And so this can help, for example, streamline the drug discovery and design process. They could also help in, for example, streamlining a lot of other industrial processes that we have. They can be used to design more efficient batteries, optimize supply chain, traffic flow. And all of these um, could, for example, lead to us being able to decrease our carbon emission and help to tackle climate change. So the three types of problems that quantum computers are best suited to are optimization, simulation and machine learning. However, as with any sort of great technology that we have, there's also some consequences. And for quantum computing, one of those consequences is the fact that it might be able to one day break the encryption systems that secure a lot of our data. And the reason behind that is related to the way that we encrypt data. So for example, if I were to give you this number, 15, and I were to ask you to give me the two prime numbers that multiply to give it, all of you would very easily be able to tell me that that was three times five. And this is essentially very trivial for a human to do. If I were to give you this number, however, you'd find that a lot more difficult. And if you had a calculator, that'd probably even take you quite a while. But this is a really easy problem for a classical computer to solve. However, what if I gave you this number and I asked you to give me the two prime numbers that multiply to give it? Not only does it turn out that this is incredibly hard for any classical computer, but that it's virtually impossible. And that is essentially the basis of a lot of our encryption systems today, like RSA. They're based on the difficulty of solving mathematical problems, such as finding the prime factors of a number, prime factorization. However, with quantum computers, because of the fact that they can perform calculations in a fundamentally different way and provide speed ups um, in particular calculations, for example, prime factorization, they might be able to one day actually solve these problems in a very trivial way. So just to put that into perspective, where it would take a classical computer about 300 trillion years to break an RSA 2048 bit encryption key, it would take a roughly 4,000 qubit quantum computer only 10 seconds. And so this obviously poses quite a worrying problem if quantum computers large enough um, were to be created. This can pose a very large scale um, cybersecurity threat across society. It could affect anything from intellectual property to, for example, the private messages um, or any data that you hold in the cloud. It could affect state secrets, trade secrets, and even um, the technology that is behind blockchain, for example, could be vulnerable to speed ups from quantum computing. And with, you know, as cryptocurrencies are getting more and more popular, this could be a huge problem for us. However, since um, Peter Shaw in 1994 essentially found the, um, came up with the algorithm that might one day be able to break encryption systems like RSA, cryptographers everywhere have been trying to find solutions um, to be able to secure against that um, eventuality. There are some classical solutions to this, for, which are called post-quantum cryptography, and they refer to classical algorithms that are able to secure against quantum computers. There are also quantum um, solutions to this, for example, quantum key distribution. 
However, the sort of effort made in this field is quite disjointed at the moment because there's a lot of different academic institutions and um, industri um, players in industry that are working towards this, but there's not yet a standardized set of solutions that a company or an executive could go to and say, I want to implement these quantum secure solutions. However, the National Institute of Standards and Technology have been looking into standardizing a set of post-quantum crypto cryptography schemes um, between roughly 2022 and 2024, um, after which really, um, you know, foot needs to be put on the pedal to be able to actually implement these quantum secure solutions. So even though we might have quantum secure solutions one day does not mean that the threat completely disappears. And this is because of something called harvest now, decrypt later. So remember that the entire security, the entire point of encryption is that if your data was to be intercepted today, um, if you had a data breach and a bunch of your data was stolen, is that encryption would still secure that because the bad actor who had access to it couldn't make sense of your data, it would all be jumbled by the encryption system in place. What if though a adversary was able to steal your data today and then wait until a cryptographically relevant computer became available and then use said quantum computer to break that encryption, then your data is already at danger. Now, this isn't gonna matter for, for example, your back credit card details that might become obsolete in the next 10 to 15 years. But if you had data that had a shelf life of more than say 15 years, for example, medical health records or trade secrets or government secrets, then that could be um, a significant problem. So this begs the question of, should we be worried? And in being able to answer that question, we really need to look at a few factors. One of that is what we've just spoken about, which is the shelf life of your data. So how long does your data need to be secured for? And in relation to that question, how soon will a quantum computer capable of breaking encryption schemes likely to be developed? Because like we said, if your data is only going to need to be secure for the next one or two years, it's not going to be a problem because we're very unlikely to have a large enough quantum computer in the next one or two years. However, if you have data that needs 15 year shelf life, then that's a um, case to worry about. We also need to look at how long it will actually take for these quantum secure protocols that are in development to actually be adopted and implemented. And that's really important to think about because if a quantum computer comes about and we yet haven't implemented those, then that obviously causes a huge problem um, at the time. And I just want to really um, hone in the point that there's a big need to become a lot more cryptographically agile than we currently are. Because historically, if we look, it does take an awful um, long amount of time to implement any sort of new cryptographic standard. This could be in the ballpark of sort of 20 to 25 years. And so there might be some significant barriers because of the way that um, companies currently um, deal with changing different cryptographic systems um, of barriers to a sort of speedy adoption of quantum secure protocols, post quantum secure protocols. And some of these barriers include, for example, an inadequate inventor inventory of all of the vulnerable nodes that a company has. So being able to identify what, what encryption systems need to be updated. This becomes an even bigger problem if there are any third party vendors involved because that just increases the surface area of attack. There's also a reliance on legacy hardware and software, which is a big problem, especially in industries like financial services and in general in flexibility of a lot of systems to be able to adopt to new um, encryption protocols. There's also the problem of high switching costs that a lot of companies um, have in mind um, and essentially a hesitancy to switch to new hardware that can support um, these new encryption systems. And that is because a lot of companies will be investing in, you know, expensive infrastructure and they want to keep that until its expiry date rather than change it up when they need to. And this is particularly true, for example, vehicles and airplanes or a lot of inter, um, Internet of Things devices like your smart, your smart aquariums or um, microwaves and so on. And so if we don't implement these sort of standards soon enough, this could be quite a big problem. 
because we might have a quantum computer that's capable of breaking them before we've done that. And there are loads of different estimates around when a quantum computer might come around that is capable of breaking those. And that's, you know, a topic that we need to discuss and talk about and think about. But in 2020, the RAND Corporation, which is a um, government run US think tank that um, publishes research papers, they actually identified the threat of quantum computing to our security systems to be imminent. And the reason they um, came to that conclusion was that they reckoned that a quantum computer large enough to break encryption systems could be available between 2033 and 2035. However, the complete adoption of post-quantum cryptography could take anywhere between the mid 2030s. And so those two timelines are just a little bit too close to comfort. And so they've put this as a sort of imminent threat. But before I hand over to Paolo and really what I wanna sort of leave you with before we start the discussion is to, from everything we've kind of sort of heard and the ideas that you have and the um, knowledge that you bring to the table, do you reckon quantum computing is an immediate cybersecurity threat or not? Um, fantastic, thank you, Anahita. So what I'd, I'd love to do um, is just immediately go into sort of almost some unstructured conversation. If people have comments they want to share or questions they want to ask, we'll do that for however long feels. Um, feels right and then I'll, I'll, I'll take it in another direction. So does anyone want to jump in either with the comment building on um, what Anahita said, a, a question of something you're not clear on or an additional thought? I have uh, I have a question. I mean, I have to say it's not my sector. I'm interested. The, the reason why me is completely um, another one, but uh, I'm quite interesting from a point of view of, um, we spoke about cryptographic, which is great. Um, I guess um, if I will have now in my house, in my home, a quantum computer, I would be able to, um, I would say, uh, solve the algorithm of blockchain in a much faster and better way, no? So uh, whatever is related to um, data my, uh, Bitcoin mining and so on. Uh, do you think uh, government or somehow in this, somebody in this world will be putting some kind of control from this point of view? Otherwise, people who has the technology, the country would have the, the technology, uh, will have some kind of richness uh, or some kind of uh, ability to uh, generate money, uh, which is 10, 100, 1,000 times more uh, than the country that do not have this technology. Is, uh, is the NIST, is this kind of standardization going toward this, uh, this route as well, this kind of... Uh, um, way of generating money, which is uh, not so uh, in, unequal between advanced country and not so advanced countries. Okay, that, that's a great question. Jorge, is your, uh, uh, do you want to ask a different question or do you want to respond to what Fisio just asked? No, yeah, I, I just want to say other things about it. If someone want to answer the question, I will wait. <laughs> Okay, does then anyone want to offer a, an answer to Ethicia's question? I don't know. I, my first thought was uh, yes, you're probably right, but that's not different from any technologies that bring in a competitive advantage, right? So if we think, you know, big data centers or, you know, the cloud, whoever is the biggest there has a competitive advantage. Uh, I, I think I'd, I tend to agree with you, Em. I think that ultimately, you know, market forces and capitalism will, will play out here. Now, one question that has that you touched on and has certainly been asked in other meetings we've had on this topic is um, when it comes to the inappropriate use of quantum computers to do things, you know, won't government stop that? Won't the, the manufacturers stop that? Um, the, the honest answer is they can't. And, and if you go to, to what Anahita explained to us a few minutes ago about the factorization of prime numbers, you know, that uh, factorizing a prime number is not illegal. You, you cannot say that, oh, this machine must not be used to do that. Now, if someone, um, if someone then uses that to, to, to steal data, then clearly they're committing an illegal act. But the, the decoding of a key and then using that information to, to commit an illegal act to two separate things. And therefore it's gonna be incredibly hard to legislate against the use of 
the technology it would would be my opinion i don't know if anyone has a, an alternative thought rupesh with things like um, i just want to mention two points one is the cloud is the democratization of quantum computing so as long as you have access to infrastructure wherever you are in the world and of course governments can control that infrastructure you can access a quantum computer the second thing is when you have protocols like uh, blind quantum computing, you have no idea what the algorithm being executed is. Oh. So unless you intercept the algorithm before it's submitted yeah. and have a look at it to see what it, if it's up to nefarious means or not, how would you know? Sorry. Um... Can I can I jump? Uh, Paul, please, just, please. Yes. It's, it's, it's very, thank you for for your answer. Uh, the question is uh, it's great. I mean, it, the question is more related to um, how uh, how we um, well. Uh, I, I believe this is going to have a big impact in the in the economy in in the concept of money, no? Because we have the idea of money, which is related to the depth of something or somebody, a piece of paper you used to you used to have the bank note, no? A piece of paper that is related to the depths of somebody. Nowadays, we generate money with uh, in 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 in, the, in a way, and definitely there will be country that will be able to generate. Uh, sorry, okay, I, I I misunderstood. So no, you're no, no, talking, I, it's yeah. me that I, I didn't pose the question. So I, I think what you're asking, and, and correct me, sorry if I'm wrong. So essentially, you know, we all know that uh, about Bitcoin mining. Um, now, what I don't know, and um, the 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 underlying algorithmical calculation views to to mine Bitcoin is different, I believe, to what we're discussing. I certainly haven't heard any argument that the quantum computers will be able to, to mine Bitcoin faster. Now, is that my ignorance or is it they, different? They would, um, I think they would be able to uh, mine Bitcoin faster. There are some algorithms that would allow them to sort of okay. solve the proof of work faster. Okay, well then that, so then then I now understand the thesis question. That, get, that gets very interesting and I guess, um, <laughs> I mean, the answer there clearly is, you know, let's see. It uh, it, it 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 makes it interesting. I think that the, the whole mining of Bitcoin question will almost certainly be resolved sooner than we'll have powerful quantum computers. But but I see where you're coming from. Jorge, do you want to jump in? I know you have some experience in the blockchain space. Hey, right now we are. I am part of the group in George Washington University, the cybersecurity group, and we are trying to use blockchain for disaster recovery. Like this pandemic, uh, you need to be assured how to protect the information in case of terrorists or uh, war or anything like this uh, critical uh, period of time. So I want to uh, maybe invite you all to work together with existing technologies like blockchain, but also with quantum, because the solutions in the future, suppose for vaccination or to protect some assets or to protect critical infrastructure, will need to work together with existing technology that we use right now. Excellent, thank you. Um, any questions for Jorge about that? Clearly, it's great to see real world use cases in, in the use of these advanced technologies. No, okay. Um, any any other questions? Um, I, I, I wanted to run some polls. Em, are you able to see the, the polls I created beforehand? When I try, it says you have no access. Oh, uh, yeah, I see something. It says uh, launch. Yeah, perfect. Okay, you, it's because you and I logged in the same account, so you obviously have the master. So so we've got a, a number of poll questions here to, to just make this a bit more interactive. So so when M puts um, the, them up, if we'll, we'll, we'll answer each one one at a time and then, and then discuss. Um, if there's any other topics, um, please do throw those into, into the chat um, as, as we go. So M, do you want to post the first poll question? Nothing's showing up. I'm not sure if you need no, to. I launched it. Oh, you've launched it. Okay. Can, can anyone else see? 
Okay, so I just, ironically, I can't see my own poll questions, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> maybe, Em, you can read it out in that case, given that I can't I'm see it. my personal account, so I don't know what's happening there. I can see it, but I don't know how to answer it. Ah, so here we go. A, a year into lockdown and we still can't use Zoom polls. This is somewhat depressing. Um, <laughs> could anyone else have any success in both seeing it and replying to it or not? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay, someone is voting. I see numbers going up. I'm going to log in with a different account then. Oh, we got six answers. It's going up 11. For some strange reasons, is 19 people can vote. There is 21 in this meeting it might be i think Paolo, yeah, it's you, probably we can vote for some reason that's <laughs> fantastic is... that's good the question is now are you able to post the results on the screen <laughs> or not uh should be able to yeah uh we got let's give a couple more seconds 15 out of 19 i voted 16. Uh, sorry rupesh did you did you get asked one question or lots of questions Lots of questions. I just ah. finished. Oh, okay, fine. That was, so, my, that was my thumbs up. Your thumbs. Okay, sorry. So we're okay. Sorry, apologies. I've literally. I live in Teams. Um, Zoom is Zoom is relatively new to me. So um, wait. Let's go through and answer all the questions. Then we'll review the answers, okay. um, one by one. So I can end the polling, which I suppose will give us the results. Let's try that. Okay. Share the results. I suppose you should be seeing on the screen the results, right? Oh, okay. okay, fantastic. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for your patience. Um, okay, so I can see that the first question here, which asked, how far away do you think the emergence of cryptographically relevant quantum computing is? And so we've obviously got a clustering in the sort of two to 10 year space. Um, uh, so that's it's interesting, of course, because we should have asked this question before Anahita spoke to us and then then asked it again. I think, um, you know, the the implications of what we heard is, of course, you know, the 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 quantum computing is some way away, but the impact on us is is now. So, you know, I would tend to agree. And if you know, if any of you have been to the other sessions where we've had experts from the quantum computing hardware and uh, algorithm space talk, you know, we are a meaningful number of years away from having powerful quantum computers and certainly available to, um, to, to, to people who are going to use them for nefarious activities. Um, my sense, or well not my sense, but my strong belief is that anyone who's thinking five to 10 years is doing themselves a disservice because, um, you know, we just need to think, you know, five years back when, you yeah, know, the majority of us were still confused when someone used the term cloud and you know, here we are now that we're cloud is so passe as a topic that you know we 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 hardly even mention it. We just work on the assumption that the majority of things are, are on the cloud. So when it comes to technology, I think those of you, uh, the forty four percent who are saying five to ten or ten plus years, I think um, you may well be uh, be in for a shock, shall we say? Any any counter thoughts, Rupesh? Do you, do you have any? You know, you you probably spend more time. Uh, debating the timeline of this than anyone else on this call. Do you have a sense of, of, of what people should be thinking from a timeline point of view? Well, the answer is, the answer is simple. You, sh you should have been thinking about it a few years back. <laughs> right, but yeah. uh, in terms of hardware capability, um, things are moving so quickly 
but I don't know what cryptographically relevant means. That's the problem. Fair, fair yeah, challenge. That's the, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, where we were coming from there was um, where, where it will be in a place suited to your, your average common or garden criminal to, uh, to, to, to try and steal data. Um, so, you know, therefore, if we're taking it from the point of view of a chief information security officer and he or she is thinking, how do I stop people moving from ransomware to quantum computer enabled attacks? What, what might that mean? Yeah, so I would, I would certainly say that um, very interesting hardware will be, is coming according to various roadmaps that have been announced, especially by photonic companies. And, um, and if, that, if that holds true, then, to, then the two to five year mark is gonna be an interesting time. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have to wait. We have to, we have to wait for it, unfortunately. Yeah. Anna, Hita? I think we can um, maybe define cryptographically relevant in terms of number of qubits. I know number of qubits isn't always the best when there's so many different qubit technologies around. But if we think of maybe the figure of, you know, 2000 and above for superconducting sort of machines, then that is in the realm of, I guess, becomes cryptographically relevant. So at what point are we able to have quantum computers that are that powerful since, you know, I think the most amount of superconducting qubits we ha can have now around maybe 50 or 70. So the question is not when will we have a quantum computer because that I do agree will probably be in the next two to five years for certain applications, but to solve these, the pro these problems that are incredibly mathematically um, intensive might be a few few years away. I think Jorge has a point. Yeah, Jorge. Wait, wait a second. Uh, I was at the meeting with uh, Caspa, the uh, Chinese American Semiconductor Association, and they gave us uh, a few days ago, the, the last Saturday, a conference about risk and uh, risk and financial uh, financial risk. And the, 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 the speaker told us about the black skull uh, equation that you use to, to forecast the the the, uh, the transacciones, the, well, the, 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 in, well, the idea is if you if you use quantum computing, we will you will change the uh, market in a way that you ever, ever never have been have uh, think before. So th I think financial institutions are very concerned about this. They're, they're concerned and and excited, I guess. I mean, essentially, if you're on the winning side of the equation, you're excited. If you're on the losing side, you're 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 concerned. Um, uh, and you know, being being crude about it, of course, you know what drives all this development. It drives, it, it, you know, it's driven by the the desire of commercial organisations for money, and governmental organisations for for power, uh, and and the defence against attack. Um, so uh, yes, I, I'm. I think where you, where certainly in the discussions I know Air Manahita and I are having, where we're seeing a lot of the, the the fear, shall we say, from the banking sector is simply because they realize they are behind their competitors in terms of how to apply this to manage their portfolios and better in the thing. So, you know, there's a, whenever you hear, learn your competitor is being smarter than, than you on something, you get nervous. Um, I think the interesting question is if, if you're sitting in a, in a risk or a security job, what you want to try and do is you want to try and separate the risk side of quantum computing in order to focus on defending against that risk whilst leaving your colleagues who are the ones making money, optimizing portfolios and, and buying and selling, et cetera, um, to use the power of it to do their jobs better. And you know, the, the underlying hardware is, is, of course, exactly the same. And the development of the hardware is, is relevant for both this defensive side and the the beneficial side. And I think certainly what we're keen to try and do in this community is to separate the two in order to let people focus on the side that is relevant for them rather than getting the, the two areas muddled up. I just want to add a bit of, a, a bit of color before we move on. Uh, 
there is this quote uh, where they say is um, people tend to underestimate uh, the, the the rate of uh, what can be done in one year, and they tend to oh sorry <laughs> they tend to overestimate what can be done in one year and underestimate what can be done in five years, right? So maybe so even shorter. Yeah, I think it's a very very good point. Um, let's move to the second question where we can touch on it quickly because um, it was it was not the, the the world's best question when I wrote it and it was simply saying right which assets do we think will be vulnerable I mean on almost all of them except the other we had sort of pretty much uh, 44 percent plus um, you know at the end of the day different uh, different people are going to want to steal different information for different reasons so um, uh, you know, the answer is frankly that all the data is vulnerable if, going back to Anahita's point, um, you know, the, the, the data still remains valid. If you're stealing data today to decrypt in 10 years, it clearly needs to have a shelf life of more than 10 years. Um, but, uh, you know, all of these banking data, medical data, et cetera, is all valuable. I was interested to see 81% um, say military secrets. I think we all know that so much of technology advancement in all types is is obviously driven by the uh the need for uh for the military to either look for dominance or to ensure appropriate defense um and you know it's also of course the area that's most difficult to find out anything about um but i would be um you know absolutely certain as i'm sure everyone else on this uh, this call is that there is ample work being done in the military domain and over time that filters down to the commercial domain so it is useful to have a sense of whether or not government and military care, and I think they do. Um, so then question three takes us on to our, uh, you know, more, more specifically this topic around, um, around CISOs. And so let's see the answers here. Um, can everyone can see these, can they, Em? You're, you're moving through the answers or how do people see the answers? I think People can just scroll to the entire list. Yeah, um, Anahita, Rupesh, can people can you ch move the answers yourself individually? Is that how it works, Matt? Thanks for the thumbs up, Matt. Okay, good. So I've moved to question three on my list. Are you or the CISOs in your organisation thinking about the threat of QC right now? Um, so no one's implementing it. That would that's not not surprising. Um, uh, three of you said you're you are thinking at the planning stage. If anyone's happy to to raise their hand and, and, and share some thoughts there, it'd be great. Similarly, um, four of you said uh, you thinking about it, but you haven't got beyond early discussion. So is anyone in that second or third group happy to, to share anything about what they're doing? Cool, no worries. I know I'm quite scary. Um, that's fine. The um, oh, someone just came off mute. I can't see who it was. No, it's gone back on mute. Okay. Um, the the aim of this group, sorry, just to take a sidebar, is 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 you know this this was purposefully a sort of early um, uh, informal conversation just to see where where people are coming from. But you know we we want to set up in June and then hopefully every couple of months uh, a proper discussion on this topic where we'll bring some relevant panelists in, you know, a mix of quantum experts, information security experts. Um, what, what I find from having run those kind of events before in various different industries is, you know, where it's really effective is if we've got real world people talking about their real world challenges. And I know this is one of these, these topics which actually people entirely understandably are hesitant about talking about too publicly, certainly not at a detailed level. But if any of you uh, are happy to share your experiences, um, then that's going to be invaluable for the community. And that includes, for example, the challenges you've had persuading other people in the organization that this is important. And we'll obviously get to a question on that in a second. Um, or where you and maybe a small group of people completely understand its importance, but actually you're being told, look, we've got far more pressing issues. So yeah, that might be urgent, it might be important, but I'm afraid it's not as urgent and as important as something else that's going on. And so you know, only by hearing some of those real world examples can we necessarily make this uh, as valuable as we would like. So yeah, if at any point in, in, in the 
sort of next 10 15 minutes you're happy to share please do that or if you want to to drop us a note afterwards saying that um you know you would be keen to participate but you know with a bit more warning so you've had a chance to to reflect on how to position your situation and paula just put it in the chat jorge and chris they're asking uh, to ah to repeat the question sorry jorge sorry chris my question was if we look at the answers to the poll um we had seven of the people say that they are thinking about the threat of quantum computing at the moment. And I was wondering if any of those seven people were happy to talk about the type of discussions going on in their organization. Cool, Chris, you've come off onto camera. Would you like to talk to us? Yeah, so I just want to say that it's, um, so, um, Chris Kwiatkowski, nice, nice to meet you. And um, I'm a part of the group, which is well, a company called PQ Shield, and we are working on post-quantum uh, cryptography and implementations, uh, both in hardware and in software. Fantastic. And Chris, how how do you get your customers interested in the topic? Um, well, they, they usually they come to they they come to us yes uh, and um but uh, also we are kind of trying to look into different areas and um, so for example hsm uh, hardware security module is one, one area where we are looking uh, heavily and the other one is uh, uh, certificates uh, digital you know the x509 digital cert certificates used on the web so yeah um yeah, various, various sources, different discussions. And are these are the people who come to you? Do they do they fully understand it, or they're just aware that it's a, a risk and they look for help from you? Rather the latter. So they are aware of a, of the risk of the fact that there is a risk, and uh, mostly goes well. They they are aware of the uh, this uh, post quantum uh, standardization process by NIST and they know that the, something could change soon. So they, they come to us to, to kind of learn and see what, how they should, how, how should they you know, plan for a change. Okay, and, and who are the individuals? Are they, are they CISOs, are they risk officers? Which roles in the company are coming to you? Um, rather C-level uh, right now. So they are mostly looking at uh, you know, how to, how to uh plan resources basically excellent thank you um any other thoughts oh jorge has just posted um haha <laughs> yes that that's Jorge. that's a, a very good point governments with uh, enough money uh, are often uh often a challenge um let's oh, let's yeah. take yeah, go, Anoj, so, go. yeah, yeah. So, so I would actually agree to the sorry, I didn't actually uh, recognize the name. So, the person who was actually mentioning about the PQC, the post quantum cryptography, I think that is the scene. Uh, even if I talk from the perspective of the Indian banking uh, uh, landscape, the same thing is actually going on. So instead of actually investing on the QKD part, the uh, main focus is as of now on the PQC. Uh, PQC Q, PQC, okay, the post quantum cryptography, uh, that is what is in focus. And they, uh, the thought process already started, and the sort of actually audience which I have actually seen, uh, but so it is not that direct interaction. It is uh, in one of the uh, webinar uh, discussion, I uh, like, uh, asked this particular question. And the sort of response I, uh, like I received is that QKD or cryptography itself at the communication side is uh, something in the pipeline. But as of now, they want to safeguard their existing system, the classical system. So like uh, that has already started. And uh, this sort of thought process is actually happening at the CIO level, at the security, the CISOs, is, uh, the people who are there in that role. or who are into the academic side of the banking. Okay, so who are heading the academic side of the banking, they are, they have started uh, discussing this sort of three topics. 
Perfect. Th thank you for that. Um, I was just thinking it might be useful because I know there's people with sort of different levels of knowledge here. Anahita, do you want to just take um, uh, one minute to explain what we mean by PQC or post-quantum cryptography? Yeah, sure. So um, post-quantum cryptography essentially refers to classical algorithms, so algorithms we can come up with our own computers right now to protect against um, quantum threats. And that's different to solutions that exist, um, which are sort of QKD, which is um, quantum key distribution, which is sort of using quantum satellites to secure data. So post-quantum cryptography just refers to the entire umbrella of algorithms. Um, that can protect against those speed advantages. Yeah, thank you. So there's certainly there's some maths calculations which quantum computers aren't super powered suitable for for, for dealing with. Um, excellent. M, do you want to take us through a couple of questions? We're just sorry, just so everyone knows, we're we're planning on finishing in ten minutes. We like to keep these discussions to to just an hour. We know how busy people are. Um, so we'll we'll go through another couple of questions and then we'll we'll spend the last five minutes just agreeing on next steps. Absolutely. So next one is if you accept there is a risk and that upgrading systems take time, why are you not actively pushing this topic right now? And majority of answers were to the went to the there are other more pressing priorities in IT. This is also fair enough. <laughs> Um, some have said I've not managed to get senior engagement and some have said I believe we'll move fast enough when time is right. This is also interesting. The last one is very interesting as well. It came up before well, uh, in other discussions we said, oh, stuff is moving to the cloud. A lot of my stuff is, uh, you know, outsourced. I will just let, you know, this third party figure it out for me. I think that's also a point people are, are trying to make. I'm wondering um, if this is true or not. Maybe Chris, sorry to put the spotlight on you, but you are a provider of those technologies. Is it the case where you know we will be able to buy security off the shelf, quantum security off the shelf? Um, yeah, that's that's what we at PQ Shield what we essentially are working on. So basically I think the most important right now is like migration to those post quantum schemes and I, i'm actually not, not an expert in qkd i only can work talk about uh, post quantum algorithms without physics let's say um so yeah i i think so the, the, there are places where you can just go and try to buy the, the implementations thank you um and, um, um, just sorry, Em, if I might, just showing from my side, um, not not directly owning, but being very involved in the IT budget in my organisation. Um, you know, if if someone came along and said they wanted to spend a meaningful amount of money doing a sort of review of what quantum computing meant for our hardware and communication technologies, which would undoubtedly lead to a request for an even larger amount of money to start to protect, I would absolutely say thank you, but no thank you. Um, uh, at, at the moment, if you know, if I didn't know what I know, and I think, you know, the the only way that that will change is as a large number of executives hear about this as a topic and about the risk, then um, you know, if you've got four or five people on your IT budget panel, and two or three of them, even though they don't understand it, saying, "Hang on, I've heard about this. Maybe we should, you know, get a get a business analyst and a, and a technician on this one for a few weeks to to learn more." Um, so, you know, my, my, my strong belief, and that's where I'm hoping we're going to go with this community, is we're going to help people understand what are the ways they can get enough people in their organization to care about this in order that they're not a lone voice in the, in the darkness calling out, but actually there's a, a broader set of people who are concerned. Uh, well, yeah. Hi, this is Anish here. So uh, one thought process which actually uh, we came to know that uh, most of these organizations uh, like uh, from the financial, sorry, uh, I'm talking about the financial domain. Uh, so they are relying, uh, relying on the uh, service providers. So for example, the telecom providers, they need to actually make up these changes in their uh, existing setup in order to upgrade to the quantum technologies instead of 
and then uh, uh, like uh, make aware uh, awareness within the uh, their customer base that uh, these technology how they can actually help out so they are not actually trying to uh, like, uh, take that first step so it is mainly the service provider which they actually when it comes to the communication part but yes as i mentioned so post quantum cryptography is something which is of their interest and something that uh, they have already initiated certain uh, projects also to uh, start working in that direction so i would say like it is much more the underlying the base uh, building blocks uh, of the providers which are actually related to those areas they are the ones uh, which would be the torch bearers if there is a large change which has to happen uh impacting a uh, larger uh all the domains so to the horizontal which will be touching uh, if there are some changes at the telecom level yeah. um another, another argument we, we heard before uh in some industries <laughs> was oh well my data is uh you know not worth enough in the sense i don't have that, that need of you know investing that much to protect my data, my data is not worth enough, which I think is also another interesting um, view on the topic, right? So, uh, how much, how expensive is going to be, you know, to uh, apply those uh, uh, algorithms to de de decrypt compared to a valuable, easier data, right? So maybe there will be a point where quantum will be super cheap and you could potentially decrypt everything, but until that point comes, uh, you know, there's also an argument of effort versus benefits of cost of decrypting versus what get data you're going to get by decrypting. I, I'm not surprised of, you know, seeing in the previous question about the, um, the one about um, number two, the most vulnerable assets, the military secrets, really, right? Those are, you know, worth <laughs> spending, you know, the efforts of a computational and uh, people to, to break those secrets more, much more than you know uh, other more commercial data. Yeah. I don't know if anyone has, has any views on this point. No. Let, let me throw in a thought having been responsible for data protection in an organization once. Um, uh, these these days the 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 often the most expensive threat is um is actually the the fines you get. So for those based in Europe, GDPR fines um, are, are astonishingly large. Um, and so, you know, your data may not be worth someone stealing on purpose, but if they essentially steal it accidentally because they're not sure of its value, so they steal it anyway, and um, that's that's proven, then um, the fines that you would be liable to are, are, are very large. So that's a factor to be brought into account. Yeah, I just wanted to add a point as well that it's whilst we're having this discussion, it's um, important to sort of think about the fact that, you know, we're talking about encryption and that's at the point where the data has already been intercepted. So if we want to sort of mitigate against the threat of quantum, as well as, you know, developing post quantum solutions, it's a good idea to which I know sort of the world is, but to look at those other IT issues, which I think a lot of people have alluded to that it's sort of more important to think about because if we make sure that data isn't intercepted in the first place, then I guess the encryption part is secondary to that. So those two conversations should sort of be happening in tandem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we've got four minutes left and one question to go. I don't know, Paolo, do you want to lead us to the closing? Yeah, so let me, um, let, let's just look at this question. So the fifth question said, would it be helpful if groups like Quantum London were were pushing these messages? Um, over half of you selected yes could be valuable. Not that I can spell the word valuable, but um, <laughs> you, you got my intent. Um, what would be great to understand, and you know, please do do speak briefly on, on um, uh, or, or throw something into the chat, but it'd be good to understand what would be be helpful. So let me just tell you sort of roughly the plan we've got, and then you can um, you, you can either say, you know, thumbs up or suggest a, an alternative. So our thinking is that we want to try and get a, a group that um, of people who are either responsible um, for this topic, who are maybe selling into the space, um, or, you know, frankly, just interested in it. Um, 
uh, to, to meet, you know, whether it's once every month, once every two months would depend to some extent on the size of the group and the exact interest. Um, some of our um, some of what we would do would be formal sort of webinars, getting a panel together of experienced people who would talk to us in the way that Quantum London's been running webinars for, uh, for a year or so now. Other ones would be discussions a bit more like this, where we may have sort of two or three um, people who, uh, you know, ask a few questions or position a few thoughts. And then we, we have a roundtable discussion. I, I realize um, that often joining one of these groups for the first time means that you're hesitant about, about getting involved. Uh, from experience, once people start to join for the second, third, fourth time, they're more comfortable whether via the chat or directly speaking. So, you know, I'm very confident we can build up over time a, a community to talk about this. And I'd just love to know if there's specific ideas or specific topics uh, that you think. Chris, you've come uh, onto camera. You've maybe got a comment and then maybe Matt would. I actually don't, don't, don't have. No, okay, that's fine. We're just letting us see. That's fine. Matt, you have come on camera. Uh, thanks, Paolo. Um, yeah, I was just sort of starting to write you an email, actually. So I don't know if you know, but I've stood up a CISO committee at the LMA. Um, so we've got uh, about 20 CISOs in the market. I was just thinking it'd be great, actually, if either you or maybe somebody else from uh, Quantum London might come along, if we can get you on the agenda at some point. I think it'd be a really good forum to raise awareness and uh, start getting the conversation going. Thank you, Matt. We'd, we'd be delighted to. Fantastic. So, yes, let's, let's discuss that afterwards. Um, Rupesh? Yeah, what, I, what I'd like to understand is sort of the value chain in all of this, because it can be very complicated. Um, and so who are the stakeholders and how do you um, and how do you uh, and how do you ensure that the trust is propagated throughout the system? Yeah, that makes sense. I think all of us who spent any time in this space know that, um, you know, the attacks come at the weakest points. So, you know, if we if we reinforce everything and then we've got a, a weak connection to the outside, then it's all for nothing. So I think that's a very good point. And I think it will be interesting, you know, talking to maybe people like Chris, his colleagues, other people who are, you know, commercially trying to sell solutions, hopefully we'll have a very good view of, of that. So let's aim to build that over the coming months. Thank you, Rupesh. Any any final thoughts or, or questions or ideas from people? No, perfect. Well, in that case, can I thank you for coming? Uh, Anahita, thank you for giving us the overview at the start. Um, thank you all. Have those those in, in, in Europe or India have a, a good evening, good night. Those in the US uh, have a good afternoon. And um, we will post um, a, a follow up date into the various Quantum London channels on Meetup and on LinkedIn um, over the over the weeks ahead. If you came to us via Eventbrite, can I uh, suggest you also join us on LinkedIn or Meetup because that's where we're most effective at giving updates. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.